things did this for themselves. After doing that for a couple of years, I decided that I was going to do this for myself. I did not talk to my wife, who has been putting up with me for 43 years now. I did not talk to God, who has been putting up with me a lot longer. I decided. I was going to do this for myself. That I would do all these wonderful things to help people realize their dream to own their own business. I decided that I would do this so that I would go to seminary and do all of these wonderful things for the Lord. So in June 1988, I resigned from the state of Louisiana and went into business for myself, realizing what I call the Campbell Enterprise. <laughs> the Campbell Enterprise was a mistake. It outright bombed. <laughs> from June 1988 until November 1990, I could not buy any business. In fact, I could not even buy a job. <laughs> and in the midst of all of that, my wife contracted cancer. So what happened was, I arrived at a certain place in my life where I had to do something. There was no going back, and I didn't really know where to go forward. I had arrived at a certain place where I had to do something. Yeah, yeah. Six wife, three small daughters who were depending upon this man who had decided to go and do this for himself without talking to his wife, without talking to the Lord. He had arrived at a certain place where he had to do something. Well, what I can say to you today, Dallas and Chapel, is that all of us at some stage or another will arrive at a certain place. Yeah, yeah. You just cannot spend your whole life doing wrong. <laughs> you can't spend your whole life mistreating trying to get over on folks and scheming on folks. You can't spend your whole life hanging out at the nightclubs and standing on the corner doing absolutely nothing with your life. Because if you do that, eventually you're going to arrive at a certain place. And let me confess that every now and then I do read the Bible. The Bible does say that don't fool yourself. God is not mocked. And whatsoever man soweth, the same shall he reap. And I declare to you, brothers and sisters, it is absolutely a fact that if you spend all of your life trying to get over on folks, trying to do folks in and trying to get over and get around and get on the folks, Eventually, it will catch up with you, and you will arrive at a certain place. And when you get to that certain place, brothers and sisters, you got to do something. The Bible says that Jacob has spent his life deceiving and scheming and manipulating, trying to have his way over and over again. He had scheme that got the birthright from his brother. He had scheme that got the blessing from his father. He had done all of those things because Jacob wanted to have his way. Perhaps some of us have been guilty of wanting to have our way. We, we didn't really care what nobody thought. We didn't care who feelings we hurt. We don't care who toes we step on. We wanted to have our way and we didn't want to have Way, no matter how much it costs. But in the midst of having his 
his way, Jacob offended some folks. And one of the persons he offended was his own brother. His brother, the Bible says, made a vow. He says, Daddy is sick and on his way out of here, and, and I'm not going to disrespect my father because he is my father. You know, that's a sermon right there. <laughs> thinking about how mom and daddy feels about it before we do it is really a sermon in itself. You know, we, we, we talk about what would Jesus do? Or maybe we need to back up and think, what would mama say? What would daddy say if I did this? You know, I, I grew up on South 13th Street and uh, going from D cells to where shallow is, we knew as boys and girls, all the Christians live on the same side of the street where D cells was. <laughs> so we didn't, we didn't want to upset nobody, so if we were cutting up, we went on the other side of the street because we were concerned about what Brother Robinson would say and Brother Smith and Brother Johnson would say. And so we went to the other side of the street and yeah. we were going to cut up. <laughs> So he decided that since I respect daddy, I'm going to wait until daddy dies. Until daddy goes on to what the other scriptures are called the grandstands of eternity. I'm going to wait till then, and when daddy closes his eyes, I'm going to do Jacob in. <laughs> And, 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 and Jacob was, was pretty smart. He knew that his brother meant what he said. So he began to get on the run, try to get out of Dodge, and try to go somewhere to get away from his brother because he knew his brother really meant, I'm going to kill you when daddy closes his eyes. Right? So when we get to chapter 28, your Bible said that he arrived at a certain place. He, he arrived at this place where he had to do something, but he was he was tired. The day was at a close, and the, the Bible said that the sun had set, and darkness began to set in, and he decided that he was going to lay down and take a nap. Right? Right? needed something to lay his head on, so he grabbed a stone and he laid his head on the stone and went into a deep sleep. In other words, in the midst of that deep sleep, he was no longer in control, so God then had his full attention. And because God had his full attention, God began to speak to him and talk to him and to tell him exactly where he stood. And so in the midst of verse 10 through 15, I realized some lessons that God has had for Jacob directly and for Donaldson Chapel indirectly. Wow. That was Jacob dreaming. He went into the midst of this dream where he saw this stairway, and he saw angels ascending and descending, which is interesting because it never says they were walking, it said they were ascending and descending, and in the midst of that, he had this God speak to him. Yeah, yeah. Let me share with you some lessons from that. One is God knows our name. He calls him by his name and begins to speak to him because God is not unaware of who we are. Right? The Bible says in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, that he said, My sheep know who I am. And I know my sheep who they are. And when I speak to them, he says, I call them 
by their name. Yeah, yeah. And he says, when I call them by their name, they answer my voice because they know who I am. Yeah. So God is speaking to one that knows who he is. He has his attention because God knows his name. Likewise, God knows who you are. You are not a stranger to God. God has made you. He knows everything. Of, well, let me talk about myself. He knows who I am. He knows everything about A. Ray Campbell. He knows how I think. He knows where I've been. He knows where I'm going. He knows how I do things. He knows everything about me. And so he knows who I am. I'm not a Ray Campbell to him, but I am his child. And so when he calls me, like Jacob, he calls me by my name. Right. And so I want to I want I want to say to Donaldson today, don't fool yourself because he knows who you are. I may not know who you are. I may not know anything about you, but it doesn't matter. He knows. He knows you to such an extent that the Bible says that he counts the hairs on your head and numbers your footsteps and your heartbeats. He knows everything about you. And he knows everything about me. To some extent, that's a spirit. <laughs> because a lot of us we try to not let folks know us <laughs> but we can't do that with God God knows our name and because he knows our name he knows our heart <laughs> he, he knows everything about our heart he knows the contents of our hearts he knows that the fight is over control of our heart <laughs> And one of the things I learned about God knowing our heart, I learned it from my wife. You see, uh, you guys are much better than I am, so but there, there have been times I haven't been very good. <laughs> but, but she stayed with me because she says she knew my heart. Yeah. That, that, that she saw the good stuff. And since the good stuff outweighed the bad stuff, she was willing to overlook the bad stuff because she knew what was in my heart. And, and, and Samuel said the same thing when he was speaking to Saul. He says that folks look at the outside, but God looks at the heart. And so you and I struggle with the fact that the Bible says, God said, David is a man after my own heart. How can that be? When he did what he did. That's because God knew what was in his heart. And God saw his heart. And because of what was in his heart, God was able to say that. You don't have to see it. You don't have to believe it. You don't have to know it. But God does. He knows your heart. But not only does he know your heart, but God also knows the works of your hands. Yeah. He, he, he knows the foolishness that we have done. He knows the good stuff that we have done. And so when you arrive at the judgment seat to give an account of your life, there's no surprise to God. He already knows the works of your hand. He, he knows whether or not you go to church on a regular basis. He knows if you are sincere and genuinely loving and kind to your brothers and sisters. He knows if in fact you give him his tithes or whether or not you steal from him. He knows your attitude toward your brothers and sisters although he gives you and I Something to think about in Galatians 6 when he said, Be careful how you treat other members of the faith. 
He knows all of that. He knows the works of your hand. He knows the contribution that you're making to this ministry called Downs and Chop. He knows all of that. And so when, when you arrive at that certain place in your life when you must hear what God has to say, no sense in trying to hide, no sense in trying to duck, he already know what you have done and what you have said. In fact, the Bible says in James that when you know to do good and you don't do it, it's just like sin. Just because you didn't say it doesn't mean you and I have not sinned. If you know to do good and you don't do it, James says it's sin. Okay, you're better than me, so let me talk about me. The good that I would do, sometimes I didn't do it. That which I shouldn't do, sometimes I did do it. Because of the sin that's in a Ray Campbell. But God, who looks at the heart, also knows the works of my hands, and he has seen fit to call me by my name. I don't understand it, but this is the way of God. He tells them, I, 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 I know I know what you have done. But I also know what's in your heart, and because of what's in your heart, I'm willing to do some things with your life, despite the works of your hands. Yeah. Right? Now, let me just say, for those of you who may not know this, I have not always been Dr. A. Ray Right, right, right. I, I, I have not always been the husband that I should be, right. or should have been. I, I have not been a whole lot of things at certain times. But God didn't give up on me. So if you have a wayward child, a wayward spouse, a wayward grandchild. <coughs> Don't be so quick to give up on them. Yeah. See, see, the Bible says, teach the child yeah. the way that he or she should go. Yeah. And if you instill certain values in them early, we might fall away for a minute. But eventually, we'll come back around. And, and the reason we come back around is because somebody is praying. See, I'm, I'm where I'm at now because somebody prayed for me. And you're where you're at also because somebody prayed for you. That, that, that's, that's one more lesson. One more lesson. God knows your heart. He knows the works of your hand. But in verse 15, he says, I'll bring you home. As if to say, Donaldson, you and I cannot go far enough away from God that he cannot bring us back home. Jacob was doing all that he could, not just to get away from Esau, but to get away from God. And here was God talking to him, and God tells him, despite your messing up, despite how wrong you have been, I can still bring you home. You just can't give up on folks, because God doesn't give up on us. He's still saying, I can bring you home. Yeah. So he tells him, I'm going to bring you home. And not only am I going to bring you home, I'm going to bless you, your offspring, right. and everybody that comes into contact with you. Yeah. Did you not know, brothers and sisters, that when you talk about blessings, 
you're talking about, actually, you're talking about a eulogy. Yeah. So when you talk about the blessings of God, such as what Paul talks about in Ephesians 3, when you talk about the blessings of God, you are literally utilizing God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talking about the way of God, the life of God, the attitude of God, the love of God, you're giving a eulogy. Yeah, yeah. And here was God eulogizing the life of Jacob by telling him, you are going to be a blessing. Yeah, yeah, right. The man that had messed up all of his life, yeah, yeah. God says, you are going to be a blessing. Yeah, yeah. So I come to tell you, God said, I don't care what you have done. I don't care where you have been. If you stay with God, your life will be a blessing to somebody. So there I was in 1988 and 1989, arriving at that certain place. Wife with cancer, three small daughters having to do something. And I made this decision. This is what I did. I had a conversation with God. And I told the Lord, I am the one that messed up. Yeah, yeah. Punish me. Let me be the one that suffered. Don't punish Christine. Don't punish that nigga. Don't punish all. Don't punish Eric. Don't let them suffer because of me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let me be the one to suffer yeah. because I'm the one that messed up. Yeah. yeah. I was on my knees looking up to God and discovered that God was there all the time. This is what God did. June 1988, November 1990. Never missed the house door. The lights never got cut. The children never missed a meal. Because I turned it over to God. And when I turned it over to God, God put my back. God made a way out of nowhere. Nobody could do it but God. So I declare to you, if you get to that certain place, when you get to that certain place, when you get to that certain place, when you get to that certain place, look up to God. Yeah.